Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to, to join the other speakers in thanking uh, Sujay and Samir for organizing this conference and for inviting me to this conference. So, yeah, my, my talk is based on a, a series of works in collaborations with uh, Matthias Gabardel, uh, Stefan Huenager, uh, Daniel Person, and uh, Harink Ronaldfitch. And it's about uh, Mathieu Moonshine. Uh, the largest Mathe group is simply M24, just another way to, to, to tell this, so nothing new. And uh, my plan is the following. So uh, I will give a, a brief introduction while I will remind you what the Mathe Munchen is about, in case, you, in case you forgot. And then, <laughs> and then in the first part of my talk, I want to discuss a bit how uh, Mathe Munchen is related to uh, symmetries of nonlinear sigma models on K3, uh, which is a bit similar to what uh, Anne discussed on, uh, on, uh, on Wednesday, but I will take uh, somehow an uh, orthogonal point of view. I will mostly discuss about or discuss in an equal footing geometric or non geometric symmetries. And then in the second part of my talk, which is uh, yeah, vaguely related to, this, to the first part, I will discuss uh, a certain extensions, uh, natural extension of the Mathe Munchen, which is called generalized. Mathieu Munchen with not much imagination, but and essentially uh, this extension will enforce, essentially will give evidence to the fact that there should be some kind of uh, CFT or vertex operator algebra structure behind this Mathieu Munchen. So let me start with the, uh, the, some basic facts about the Mathieu Munchen, just uh, from an abstract point of view. So we can formulate Mathieu Munchen in this way. So for each element of this Mathieu group, N24, we can assign, or for each conjugacy class, if you want, we can assign uh, a certain functions, which we call the twining genus, which is a function from the upper half plane to the complex plane, uh, times complex plane into the complex numbers. And these functions have some very nice properties. Well, property zero is that uh, for g equal the identity, uh, this is simply the elite genus of K3. Then, as I've been told uh, uh, various times, all these functions are weak Jacobi forms of weight 0 and index, and index 1. Uh, under some subgroup of SL to Z in general, and the subgroup depends on the element G that we are looking at. So in particular, if G has order N, then the relevant subgroup is gamma 0 N, which is the subgroup of SL to Z where uh, the entry C is a multiple of n. And also let me notice that in some cases one needs to introduce some non-trivial multiplier in these uh, modular properties. <laughs> and the third interesting property arises if we consider uh, a decomposition into n equals four characters. So we can decompose all these functions into characters of the n equals four algebra. And then the coefficients in front of these characters are uh, characters or uh, representations of N24. So in case of the BPS uh, representations, we have uh, characters of virtual representations of N24. For all the other cases, so all the massive uh, uh, N equals 4 representations, we have uh, actual representation, non-virtual representations of, of N24. So we can rephrase this last, this last part by saying that uh, there must be some vector space, okay, which can be written in this way. It is a, a direct sum of a tensor product between M24 representation and N equals 4 modules. Okay, so it's an infinite sum here. And the twining genera are the, uh, somehow the characters of this, of this vector space. And the very special property is that these characters are modular in a sense. Because uh, you wouldn't expect this in general, because the characters of n equals 4 superconformal algebra alone are not modular. So uh, they must combine in a very specific way to give rise to, to Jacobi 4. And this result is, the, uh, this is a result of the work of various people, starting from uh, the initial observation of Eguchi Gurita Chikawa uh, until the uh, proof by Gannon that this, uh, this module exists. So the basic question is, uh, what does this space represent, and why are these characters modular? Well, 
the, the first suggestion, since we are looking at n equals 4 super conformal algebra, we have modularity. The first suggestion is to look at uh, conformal field theories, so n equals 4 for super conformal field theories. And in particular, at uh, nonlinear sigma models with target space k3. Okay, so let's see what happens in a generic nonlinear sigma model with target space k3. So let us uh, suppose this nonlinear sigma model has a group of symmetry G that commutes with, n, with the n equals 4 for superconformal algebra. And in this case, we can define a function, which is uh, the twin ingenuous uh, for each element of the group G, where we simply take the definition of the elliptic genus, okay, and we insert inside the trace this element G. Okay, this has a well-defined action on the space of states, so this is a well-defined function. And it turns out that this function, phi g, satisfies all the properties that we saw in the previous slide, but with respect to the group g instead of m24. Okay? In particular, this g module, now h, this vector space, turns out to be the space of uh, BPS states with respect to the uh, right-moving n equals 4 superconformal algebra. And the modularity properties of this uh, twin in general follow from the interpretations of this genera uh, in terms of a path integral on a torus with modular parameter tau. So in particular, if you take the phi g twin in genus, this should be given by a path integral on a torus where we impose that the fields are periodic under one of the cycles of the torus. While around the other cycle, they are not quite periodic, but they are only periodic up to this transformation G. Okay? This means that uh, uh, we cannot expect this path integral to be uh, invariant under the four modular group because SL to Z will mix up this periodicity transformations, but it will be only invariant under the group that fixes these periodicity uh, conditions, which is gamma zero n. Okay, so. It is clear from this picture that uh, if we could find a nonlinear sigma model with the target space K3 with the, where the group G is M24, we would have immediately explained this Matthew Moonshine. But as has been told, this nonlinear sigma model does not exist. So it's not clear so far if there is even any relation between nonlinear sigma models on K3. Well, probably nonlinear sigma models on K3 are somehow ruled out. Okay, they are not exactly the right. Uh, uh, theories to look at to explain Mathieu Moonshine. However, one can think that they are somehow related to, to Mathieu Moonshine, and at least uh, uh, in the sense that uh, one would like to see the, some uh, chiral Duran complex based on K3, which uh, can be obtained making some manipulations starting from these nonlinear sigma models. Or one would try to look at other kind or uh, um, uh, more general uh, uh, superstring theories. Like, uh, for example, type 2 superstrings compatified on K3 uh, times something else, maybe, and then uh, these this superstrings contain these uh, this nonlinear sigma models. So it is interesting in the to try to understand how, if there is a relation between the symmetries that we see of this nonlinear sigma model and this group N24. And this I will discuss in the first part of my talk. Now, the, the the description of the twin in general in terms of path integral on, on a torus uh, suggests uh, uh, an immediate uh, generalization of this twin in general. In general. So instead of taking a path integral on a torus with the fields periodic under one cycle and twisted under the, under the other cycle, we could take a path integral where the fields are twisted under both cycles uh, with respect to some to a commuting pair of elements of the group G, okay? So for a nonlinear sigma model with a group G of symmetries, uh, we can take these path integrals, and this defines some new functions, which we call a twisted twin in general. And this new function should satisfy similar properties as the twin in general that we've seen before. And uh, in particular, there should be some weak Jacobi form under some uh, subgroups of the cell to set. So this is what happens for a nonlinear sigma model. So it is kind of natural to expect that something similar will happen also for our M24. And this is the basic idea of the generalized Matthias Munchen. So we conjecture that there are, for any G and H in M24, there are, in fact, this twisted twin and genera, so some weak Jacobi force, which satisfy all the expected properties uh, for, 
for the twin in general in a good conformal field theory. So the name comes from, from actually the old uh, generalized, uh, generalized monstrous moonshine, which was proposed by Norton in, uh, uh, in the 80s. So it's uh, uh, in the context of uh, monstrous moonshine. So it's, uh, it's a very old idea. In fact, we, we just uh, take the analog of this idea and, and uh, try to, to work it out for the, for the Mathieu moonshine case. And I will show you in the second part of my talk that there is very strong evidence that this conjecture is true. OK? Good. Let's start from the first part. So how do we? So the, the main point is, is there a relation between any relation between N24 and nonlinear sigma models on K3? So the first hint that such a relation exists can be found in this Mukai theorem, which appeared already in, uh, in Anstok, I think. So uh, Mukai theorem is a theorem in algebraic geometry and states that all finite group of symplectic automorphisms of a K3 surface are subgroups of the Mathieu group N23, which in turn is a maximal subgroup of N24. Okay? So symplectic automorphisms are the ones that preserve the, the uh, holomorphic uh, 2 0 form on this K3 surface. So this has been proved by Mukai in 88. There were some previous works by, by Nikuling, who classified the, the abelian finite groups of symplectic automorphisms. And uh, an alternative proof of the theorem has been given by Kondo in 98. This is a much simpler proof, and in fact, it's the, the one that I could understand at least. OK, so this is about uh, just the geometry of K3. So how is this related to nonlinear sigma models? Well, the point is that if you have such a complex surface with uh, some group of symplectic automorphisms, we can always choose the, a metric compatible with the complex structure and the B field on this surface, which are invariant under this group of symplectic automorphisms. So this means that. Uh, each symplectic automorphism induces a symmetry on the corresponding nonlinear sigma, mo sigma model. And there is a nice property here. Uh, in the cases where, well, the, the one can compute the um, twining genus for this, uh, respect to these uh, symmetries. And the twining genus turns out to be uh, exactly equal to the corresponding one in the Mathieu Munchen case. Okay? So all these groups are subgroups of N24, so we can, uh, to any symplectic automorphism, one can associate a class in N24, and the twining genus associated by this, uh, computed by the symmetry equals the one in the Mathieu Munchen. Now, in general, the group of symmetries of nonlinear sigma models is la can be larger than just the symmetries which are induced by uh, geometric symplectic automorphisms. So when the Mathieu Munchen came out some years ago, it was kind of natural to, uh, to conjecture that one could somehow uh, extend this Mukai theorem so that there was some quantum ana analog of Mukai theorem uh, for the classification of the groups of symmetries of nonlinear signal models. And the expectation was that in this quantum analog of Mukai theorem, instead of the Mathieu group M23 here, we would have found the Mathieu group M24. Okay? So let me stress that uh, even if, I mean, this expectation somehow uh, wouldn't be an, really an explanation of the Mathieu moonshine in a sense. So in order to explain the Mathieu moonshine, we, you would really have to find one point in the modular space of K3 models where the whole group N24 is realized. Okay? While finding some analog of Mukai theorem where all groups are classified by this N24 uh, is not a direct explanation of the Mathieu Munchen. But on the other hand, it would put somehow, it would establish at least the relation between these models and the Mathieu group, and then what could try to, to understand what, was, what were the details. Anyway, so at the time, we, we started to, to study this problem of classifying symmetries with the, together with Stefan and Matthias Gabardil. And the result was quite surprising, because instead of the Mathieu group and 24, we found a different finite group, which is the Conway group, Conaud. Okay? So Conaud is the group of automorphisms of the Leech lattice. And in turn, the Leech lattice is the 
uh, is a even self-dual lattice uh, of dimension 24, positive definite. And it's characterized among these lattices by the fact that it has no elements uh, of square norm 2, so no roots. And also by the fact that it is the only such lattice that has nothing to do with the umbral moonshine. So this is a more recent characterization of the Leach lattice. <laughs> So how is the, the, the theorem, more, more precisely? So suppose G is the group of symmetries of a nonlinear sigma model on K3 that commutes with uh, the n equals 4, 4 superconformal algebra and with the spectral flow. So this is a, a little technical uh, detail, but uh, it's just to um, exclude some, some annoying symmetries that uh, uh, act, for example, by plus one on the Neves-Schwartz and minus one on the Ramon sector, which is not very interesting. Yes, yes. yes. So the result is that such a group is always a subgroup of the Conway group, and in particular is a subgroup that fixes pointwise a sublattice of the Leach lattice of rank at least four. Okay. There is also a converse theorem. If you have any subgroup of the Conway group with this property, then there, there exists some nonlinear sigma model on K3, which has the group G as its group of symmetries. Okay. So this is based on various assumptions on about the moduli space of the K3 surface and the, and the fact that uh, uh, nonlinear sigma models exist on the various points in the moduli space, but they are a kind of standard assumptions when you work with the, with the nonlinear sigma models. Okay, so M34 is also a subgroup of Conod, so this is good, but... Is this the smallest group? Which sir? Is this the smallest group which contains all the uh, I'm not sure. So one can, well, one can, the Conod as a center, which is a Z2, one can quotient out Z2 or things, uh, one and they, you can uh, all G's are subgroups in of co one that for sure uh, I don't know if there is a smaller group of co one but they cannot be much smaller in a sense because okay one can say it cannot be much smaller of co one can be co two <coughs> I cannot exclude and in fact in the in our paper co one appears because I was trying we were trying to do the smallest possible group in a sense but I think co is kind of more natural in the classifications. So. Oh, hmm? in the, from the proof, so the proof gives automatically conod. And then from the fact that they are all subgroups of conod with some properties, you can find that you can also map them uh, to subgroups of uh, co one. But conod is really what appears on, on the face. So. And also this characterization is clear in conod, not in co one. Okay, M24 is a subgroup of Conod, but it doesn't fix a sublattice of rank 4, so it's not one of these groups. And this fits with what is said, that M24, there is no group G that contains uh, M24. This thing is also fine uh, more, more directly. There's an easier argument when one just looks at the uh, Ramon Ramon ground states and check if there, uh, if there can be an action of N24, a non-trivial action on the states that preserve N equals for supersymmetry, and it turns out that uh, in some sense the space is too small and it cannot contain any uh, representation of N24. Uh, but what we were looking uh, was more, uh, what we were hoping for was more uh, N24 as a kind of classification group. So we were hoping that all groups somehow are embedded in N24. And this is also not true. There are some symmetry groups, G, which are not contained in N24. And we call this model exceptional, but essentially the definition of exceptional is that their symmetry group is not in N24. Okay? So it seems, it looks like, uh, okay, this address looks like mm, somehow uh, N24 has nothing to do with the symmetries of uh, K3 sigma models. On the other hand, there are some little hints that there might be some relation, okay? So one hint is this Mukai theorem, because uh, it, it looks very nice from this point of view. 
There is another theorem, there is another observation, okay? This is based on experimental data in the sense that uh, uh, we know uh, in the examples where we know it works like this, but it, there is no general proof. So the, the observation is that whenever the, the group is a subgroup of N24 in a, with some, in a some more precise sense, we specify, that whenever the group is in N24, then the twin in general induced by the symmetry Symmetries exactly coincide with the ones from Matthew <coughs> Moonshine. So this is true, as we said, for the uh, when the group is just given by symplectic automorphism, but it's also true for other uh, non-geometric symmetries that uh, are still inside M24. Okay. The suitable sense is because uh, well, one has to be a bit more specific than just that. Uh, the point is that. Uh, so the precise statement is that the nonlinear sigma models on K3 has a 24-dimensional space of Ramon Ramon ground states. Okay, so this G acts on this 24-dimensional space, and also N24 has a 24-dimensional representation. So the condition is that G is a subgroup of N24, and the representation of G on the Ramon Ramon ground states must be the one induced by N24. Okay, so this excludes the case because in some cases G can be Z2. And then it's obviously a subgroup of N24, but there are, it can act in many different ways. OK, this seems to suggest that there might be some relation. So it might be that one can reconstruct the N24 looking at these models or doing some strange manipulation of nonlinear sigma models. So we have two range of problems. One should, should try to enlarge these groups in order to obtain the full N24. So in this sense, if one looks at full Superstring theory, compatifications, etc. Uh, one might hope that more or less the symmetry groups enlarge, okay? Because what the symmetries group are are really so. What really happens is that these are groups of uh, self dualities, okay? One have uh, general uh, string dualities, and you look at the point in the moduli space where uh, which are fixed under some subgroup of dualities, and this you interpret these dualities as symmetries. So if you look at full superstring theory, maybe in a lower dimensional compatification, the group of dualities somehow is a, a stance. And then you expect that the groups of the lower dimensional theory, the groups of symmetry in specific points, will be larger than just this. Okay. Uh, or another idea is that one could try to, to surf in the modular space of uh, uh, knowledge and sigma models and to try to pick up the groups from different points okay, in the modular space, as, as was suggested by by, in a sense, in a slightly different context by uh, Catherine and, and Dan, and try to reconstruct the whole N24. In both cases, one has a, a problem that one has to deal with groups which are not contained in N24. So you would <coughs> expect to, to obtain something bigger of N24 than N24 if you, uh, by this kind of reasonings. Okay? So in case of uh, uh, Anne and Catherine, uh, had this argument that when you look at the chiral the run complex, it kind of makes sense to look at the, uh, to just restrict to to symplectic automorphism, so to the geometric ones. Uh, from a point of view of string theory compatification, I think it's more difficult to make this kind of argument because somehow uh, I don't think there is a good way to distinguish between uh, what is geometric, what is not geometric in a, a duality invariant sense. Let's see. So. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, but they, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree. There is, but the geometric interpretation is not a, a duality invariant concept. Sure. So what, they, what appears? There are some symmetries where a priori we say they have no chance to be geometric. Yes. Because they're not based yes, 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 yes. But there are, yeah, in, in the same model. You, Yeah, but the, for example, there are models where you have symmetries that look geometric in one picture. They look non-geometric in the other picture and, vis and vice versa. And when you combine them, you obtain something which cannot be geometric in any picture. So it, it's a bit difficult in a, to, to do. But yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's true. I mean, that's
So if you surf uh, only among the, among the groups that are in M24, what do you mean? Uh, yeah, that's, that might be an idea. Uh, I don't know how to implement this. I don't know what kind of group you would obtain. And also, I would like to give some uh, argument of why one I mean, it's a bit, uh, it's a, it's a bit ad hoc to exclude the, the, the groups that are not contained in N24 just because you want to obtain N24 in a sense. All right, so, but, uh, so what I want to do, in fact, is to try to give some argument of these and discuss a bit these exceptional models. Yep. Yes, if we look at the exceptional ones, presumably hmm? the quieting general still split up into different representations of the group, right? Yeah. Does that give any hint as to what? Sorry? Does that give any hint? Yeah, so, okay, I, I will discuss, so the, 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 my first part of the talk is about uh, exceptional groups, in fact. So I, 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 want, I wanted, in fact, to discuss these groups. So, I, so what we wanted to do is really to look at this exceptional, to try to find what the kind of nonlinear sigma models are exceptional, and to check if they have some, ni some particular special properties for which that somehow distinguishes, distinguishes this, this uh, these models from, the, from all the other ones, okay? Now, there is a little problem in doing this. So, our, uh, the theorem here is, is a non-constructive theorem in the sense that it tells us that for a given uh, subgroup of Connaught, we know that a nonlinear sigma model exists with that symmetry group, but we don't know anything else in general. So, we don't have any clue about how the model looks like, uh, spectrum, etc. So, this is this makes this study quite difficult. So the idea, so with the, together with the Matthias, we started to look a bit at uh, uh, models that uh, we understand a bit what happens, which are torus orbifolds in general. And looking at this, we have some kind of surprising results in a sense. So we wanted to ask, okay, we wanted to understand why this, in this sense, these models are exceptional. So we studied this torus orbifold. So these are very special families of nonlinear sigma models on K3, where we have some control on the CFT. Uh, this is not true for generic K3 models, okay? Now, what I will show, what we found is that all uh, cyclic torus orbifolds are actually exceptional models. Okay, so all these all these models that we are looking at have a, a, a group of symmetries which is not inside N24. The vice versa is almost true if you want to be optimistic, or uh, is false if you want to be <laughs> uh, more pessimistic. So one can say that most of the exceptional models are actu actually cyclic torus orbifolds, but there are some families of exceptional models which are not. So this was kind of a failed attempt to characterize uh, these exceptional models as uh, orbifolds of torus models, okay? So it is failed, but I think it teaches a bit some things about, uh, about the, this model. So I would like to, to discuss a bit how we came to this conclusion. So let me stress that by torus orbifold, I mean both uh, symmetric and asymmetric orbifolds of torus, okay? Yes, I will just look at the uh, orbifolds by cyclic groups. Yeah. So general, very quick, remind, uh, just to remind you the basic facts about torus orbifolds. So if you want to take an orbifold, one starts with the CFT, with the symmetry G over the N. You introduce the twisted sectors, okay? And then you restrict to the G invariant states, okay? So this is you form this vector space, and this turns out to be a space of states of a new conformal field theory, C tilde, which is our orbifold CFT. Now, there are some conditions uh, in order for this uh, uh, C tilde to be a, a well-defined CFT. In particular, there's a, a level matching condition that tells us that in the twisted sectors, uh, the spin, so the difference between the left and right conformal weight must be uh, an integer uh, over n where n is the order of this. Uh, in case it is not, the level matching is not satisfied if there is, if there is uh, differences somehow shifted from this, z over n, okay? Uh, yeah, the basic example is when 
uh, C is a nonlinear sigma model of some target space that has some uh, automorphism, and then one can take uh, the R before those, this nonlinear sigma model, and this turns out to be simply the nonlinear sigma model on the geometric R before, okay? But this is only a special case, okay? In general, in general, uh, uh, there are more general cases than that. Okay, so let's consider the 4-4 uh, superconformal field theories. So if you have a 4-4 uh, superconformal field theories at central charge 6, there are only two known kind of theories here, which are nonlinear sigma models on K3 or T4. So for simplicity, so there might be in principle other components in the moduli space that uh, we don't know about, but for simplicity I will assume that these are the only uh, possibilities. So these two cases are distinguished by the elliptigenous, or if you want, by the Euler number of target space, which is the elliptigenous at z equals 0. So it's either 24 for k3 or 0, 44. And these are the only possible uh, values for co-sister theories, as Catherine told us on, uh, on Wednesday. So if we have one such, sim one such theory and we have a symmetry that commutes with n equals 4, 4, then the R fold, if consistent, but be again n equals 4, 4. So it must be again a nonlinear sigma model on T4 or K3. Okay. Now, what we want to do is the following. Uh, we want to, <coughs> well, we would like to understand which K3 models can be described as torus R folds. Okay. And uh, the difficulty of this is that we want to, to do this uh, just knowing, so just knowing the, the symmetry group of our K3 model. So you give me a K3 model with a symmetry group. You don't tell me which will be a subgroup of co naught You don't tell me anything else about this model. And I would like to understand if this is an orbifold or some torus. Okay? So I need some more facts about uh, orbifolds construction. So one fact is that uh, the orbifold, in a sense, is a two-way, two ways construction. Okay. So the point is that uh, suppose we have a consistent orbifold, C twiddle by a, a symmetry of order n, then the, the orbifold theory contains a quantum symmetry G twiddle, which acts by phase uh, and the root of unity on the uh, twisted sectors. Okay. So we can think of taking the orbifold of C twiddle by G twiddle, and if we do this, we come back to the original theory C. Okay. And the quantum theory under this orbifold is the old G that was here. So in a sense, the orbifold theory and the original theory are some kind of on the same level, and one can go back and forth between these two theories by taking, by taking orbifolds. Now, this is, gives me a criterion for characterizing torus orbifolds. So a K3 model C is a torus orbifold if and only if it has a symmetry of order n such that the orbifold is consistent and there's a T4 model, okay? Just by this thing. So now the point is that suppose we have a K3 model with a group of symmetries, we have to decide if uh, for each symmetry G, the orbifold is a T4 model or is a K3, okay? This is the problem. So to do that, we have to compute the orbifold elliptigenous, okay? So this is given by this uh, standard formula, which follows immediately, essentially, from from this description of the spectrum. So these guys here that appear here, these functions here, are the twisted twin in general that I mentioned in the, in the introduction. Okay? So if you have uh, two symmetries G and H that commute, one can define this twisted twin in general. So in general, they are given by the trace of the element H in the G twisted sector. Okay? The ones that I need for the uh, so when G is the identity, this reduces to the old twin in general that we consider earlier. Now, the ones that are involved in the orbifolds are very special, okay, twisted twin in general, in the sense that G and H are uh, uh, in the same uh, cyclic group, okay? So in this case, it turns out that this phi G, I, G, A is that this twisted twin in general is just a modular transformation of a twin in genus of a generator of the cyclic group, okay? And then one fact is that the level matching condition for the orbifold through G is satisfied if and only if this phi GK, this twin in general, have a trivial multiplier 
for all k. So we saw that in general, this phi j k can have are modular, but can have multiplier. And the presence of multiplier is related to a failure of the level matching condition in the in the twisted sector. Okay. Okay. Very good. So we have reduced the problem to computing these guys, but we can further simplify our story because we just need the uh, elite genus at z equals zero. So we need this function as z equals zero. So at z equals zero, uh, these functions are constants because they just get contribution from the 24 Ramon Ramon ground states. Okay? And the constant is automatically modular invariant. So this constant must be also equal to the elite genus of GK uh, evaluated as z equals zero. Okay? On the other hand, we this guy we can compute. So this is just the trace of the element G over the 24-dimensional representation of Ramon Ramon ground states. And essentially, by the construction of, the, uh, of our theorem of the symmetry groups, this is simply the trace of the, this is simply the 24-dimensional representation of the Conway group. Okay? So we can compute these guys just knowing the conjugacy class of the symmetry G inside the Conway group. Okay? So this is the only thing that one needs to know. This is quite non-trivial. Just knowing the, con the, conjug the Conway conjugacy class of G, we can determine if the R before by G is a K3 or a torus model. We still have to check if the level matching condition is satisfied. So one observation is that if this uh, twinning genus is different from zero, then there cannot be any non-trivial multipliers, okay, because it wouldn't be consistent here. So if this is different from zero, then for sure the level matching condition is, is satisfied. The other hand, suppose that uh, this is zero, then in this case we don't know if there is a trivial multiplier or not. We can try to plug these guys inside this formula anyway. And then if the potential orbifold the elliptic genus is different from zero or 24, then we know that the orbifold theory cannot be a consistency of T. And this, and then the level matching condition is not satisfied. So the only undetermined case is the one where this guy is zero, and the potential orbifold elliptic genus is zero or 24, because in this case we cannot decide if the orbifold is really consistent or not. Okay. But uh, among all the relevant conjugacy class in Conod, there is only one case which is undecided from this point of view. So, so this is quite nice. So now it's clear what we want to do. We take the conjugacy classes of Conod. Now we want to restrict to the ones that preserve a sublattice of rank at, at least four, because these are the ones that give us symmetries of K3 models. So there are 42 such classes. OK, and then we check. We do this kind of check, and we compute the uh, orbifold elite genus, or uh, we check if the uh, uh, level matching condition is satisfied or not, etc. Okay. So I will show you in the next slide the, the results of this analysis. Let me stress here that one could take a, a different route, so to, to do the same, to obtain essentially the same results. One could start from torus models, no linear signal model on T4, classifies the group of symmetries of these torus models, and then take all possible orbifolds and check if they are K3 models or if they are T4. And in this way, you, you can determine all families of torus orbifolds, OK? So this could be done. Uh, it's a bit surprising, but uh, I couldn't, yeah. The, the, there was no classification of the group of symmetries of torus model that preserve uh, n equals 4 for superconformal algebra. At least I couldn't find it. So this, I did this exercise recently, and, and I determined and I did this, uh, uh, obtain these results, and they match perfectly with the analysis from the point of view of K3 model. And also, this analysis fixed the only undetermined case here. OK. So what are the results? The results are the following. So we have 42 Conway conjugacy class in Conway. 18 of these classes uh, correspond to elements which are in some N24 subgroup of Conway. 24 classes cannot be contained in any N24 subgroup. So when G is in N24 and the R before this consistent, then the R before this always a K3 model. So R before by N24 seems to give always K3 models. The equivalent of this, 
uh, rephrasing of this is that all torus orbifolds contain at least one symmetry which is not inside N24. Because they contain the quantum symmetry, the orbifold by the quantum symmetry must be the torus, and the, and the a symmetry whose orbifold is a torus cannot be in N24. So this means that all torus orbifolds are exceptional. Okay? Now we study the other classes which are not in N24, and it turns out that in 22 out of 24 classes, uh, the symmetry G appears only in torus orbifolds. So this means that most, in this sense I say that most of the exceptional models correspond to torus orbifolds. Okay? Unfortunately, there are two exceptions, otherwise we would have found a, a nice characterization of exceptional models. So two exceptions are two classes of order 6 and 8 that appear in some K3 models, and generically, the K3 models with this family, uh, with these uh, symmetries are not torus orbifolds. Yep? Non abelian torus orbifolds. Non abelian torus orbifolds. Very good. Yes, 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 very good. In fact, yeah, I want to, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So let me comment on this because, uh, uh, yeah, uh, what's the meaning of this, of this construction in the end, right? So we found that some encouraging result in the sense that cyclic torus orbifolds almost coincide with exceptional models, but exceptional, exceptional models are slightly larger than this. So, okay, maybe it is just a coincidence, but uh, maybe, maybe there is something behind this, and maybe one should really include non-abelian torus orbifolds and this would uh, uh, take into account all exceptional models. Uh, this was difficult to check from the point of view of K3 models. Now it's a bit easier from the point of view of uh, nonlinear signal models on T4, but uh, I haven't done it yet. There is a one more, uh, one further question, which is, uh, okay, and so what? <laughs> so, okay, suppose that you find that, that all exceptional models are torus orbifolds. Yeah, what does this tell us? Uh, does this teach us uh, something about the Matthew Munchen? So it is a bit difficult to, to make the, uh, to, to give an explanation or, or an argument for this. I think the best, the best argument is the following. Uh, we saw, so we know that all uh, orbifolds of torus models contain some, uh, an, some extended chiral algebra. So the chiral algebra of these models is not just the n equals to 4 superconformal algebra, but it's slightly larger. It contains at least always a, one more current. Okay? Uh, this extended, this additional holomorphic fields appear via spectral flow in the elliptic genus, in the sense that they contribute to the elliptic genus uh, with minus signs. Okay? So these holomorphic fields are massive. Uh, rep n equals 4 representations that enter with the minus signs in the, in the LT genus. On the other hand, we know that the, from the Mate Moonshine that all massive representations are, uh, are positive. So it looks like one, has, one should probably try to exclude the models where there are representations that enter with the minus sign. And if you restrict to these models and you try to surf in the moduli space where these models are, are uh, um, projected out, are, are uh, uh, excluded, maybe one can be able to uh, reobtain N24. Okay? It's also, the other point is that it's kind of easier to uh, surf when the, uh, when the, the I, I'm borrowing your terminology, it's, <laughs> it's easier to surf when the dimensions of the space they're looking at is constant. Okay? Hmm? It's very hard to serve us. That's a, yeah, that's a good observation, yes. <laughs> on the other hand, the torus orbifolds are, uh, are the nasty ones from this point of view. So, and in general, actually, all models that we know explicitly are, are nasty from this point of view. Because the fact that we have control of the CFT depends on from the fact that the chiral algebra is enlarged. Okay, so, uh, so it's a bit, yeah. Gapner models are, are uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. The, now what you can try to do is to look at some models with the extended chiral algebra, study the symmetries there, and then try to deform, at least formally, away from this model and to go to
to take some generic deformation and preserve some symmetries, but try to lift all the, the, the extended part of the chiral algebra and check what the groups are there. This is the best that one can do, I think. Okay. So this is a bit the sense of this, of this exercise. And yeah, if you exclude all these models with the negative contribution, with the standard carrier algebra, in particular, we kill 22 out of 24 classes, at least, of the, of the ones that are out, outside M24. We should check this, uh, these two additional classes. Oh, really so if you have a CFT description of some point on the KT model like this, yeah. Uh, so this, this, so in sense, this act on the lattice of the brain charges in your in your CFT. The lattice of the brain charges is unimodular, but it has sign signature four comma twenty. So it's not exactly the same of the as the leech, but somehow uh, you can do some tricks somehow to change the the signature of this four, in a sense, and to and to. Uh, and to connect uh, this uh, uh, gamma 4,20 lattice to the, to the Leach lattice, in the sense that essentially the, the action of the Conway group on the Leach lattice can be mapped to an action on this, uh, on this charge lattice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because the, yeah, the, four, the four part, yeah, the, the positive four dimensional part is fixed by all symmetries, by our. Uh, conditions. So the only, the symmetry group can only act on the 20. Okay. Then the 20 is definite. Let this you can embed inside the leech. And then you can check that all symmetry groups that act on this 20 can be extended to automorphisms of the leech. And this means that they must be, they must be subgroups of Connaught. So this is the idea. No. Uh, sorry, the, the, no, only the sub-lattice of the D-brain charges, of the, of the D-brain charge lattice, where G acts uh, non-trivially. So you have a symmetry group G, you have some sub-lattice which is fixed by G, and some lattice where G acts non-trivially. The part which is fixed non-trivially is always, you can always embed inside the Leach lattice. And the action of the group you can is, uh, can be extended to an action as automorphisms of the Leach lattice. Okay, so this concludes the first part. Whoa, la, la. Okay, <laughs> of my talk. <laughs> it's a bit slow. So let's go to the second partially related part, which is this generalized Matthew Munchen. So it's still noon, right? No. No, we have about 12 minutes. 12 minutes, okay, very good. Okay, so I will be faster here. So this is the same as the first slide. So these are the twin in general, okay? And uh, um, no, sorry, sorry, you're right. You have, you have twenty. You have ten minutes. Okay, 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 <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so as we saw in the introduction, uh, one can try to generalize the this Mathieu-Mouchin story by introducing this twisted twin in general, phi GH, okay, which depend on two elements of n So let's take the example again of nonlinear sigma models on K3 with some symmetry group to check what properties we would like to have from this twisted twin in general. So we know for each uh, symmetry G, we can take a twisted sector, HG. So we are looking at some nonlinear sigma model on K3. So if you take another symmetry H, this will induce a map on the twisted sectors. In general, the map goes from the G twisted sector to the H G H minus one twisted sector. Okay? And this is actually an isomorphism. So this shows that uh, the, this, the twisted sector only depends on the conjugacy class of G in, uh, in G in um, up to isomorphisms. It also shows that if we take H to commute with G, then uh, we have a map from HG to itself, and it makes sense to take a trace of this. Okay? And in this way, we define this uh, twisted twin in general. Right? Now, uh, this rho G here uh, generates a representation of the centralizer of G, okay? which is the uh, subgroup of elements that, that commute with G. But in general, this is only a projective 
representation. Or if you want, it's a, a representation of some central extension of this, of this group. Uh, this, all, this implies that, in general, there is a certain ambiguity in how to uh, decide the phases of these guys, and so a certain ambiguity in the definition of the phases of the twisted twin in general. Okay? Now, from the description, there is clearly a decomposition into n equals 4 characters, similar to the other case, because uh, Hg decomposes into n equals 4 representation. So in this case, we, in this decomposition, we have traces uh, the coefficients in this decomposition are traces over this projective representation of the uh, centralizer, okay? And uh, these guys are invariant up to a phase uh, under conjugation thanks to this automorphism, uh, isomorphism. And uh, again, one should allow for possible phases to appear here, again, due to the fact that these guys are generically projective, okay? And uh, the phase is ambiguous. What about the modular properties? Well, this twisted twine in general can be given by path integral where we, with these twisted periodistic conditions, so we expect uh, this path integral to be invariant under some subgroup of SL to Z that preserves these conditions up to conjugation in the, in the, in the group G. Okay, so these are the properties uh, one expects in a nonlinear single model, and this help us to formulate a precise conjecture so the conjecture is the following for the generalized moonshine. So for each commuting pair of n 4 there must be a weak Jacobi form, weight 0 index 1. So they must be invariant under conjugation up to a phase. Uh, under SL to Z transformation, uh, this twisted tiny in general must transform into one each other. So in particular, uh, they will be invariant under the subgroup that fixes these guys. Okay. And again, one should allow for non-trivial multipliers to appear here. And then we want some <coughs> decomposition into n equals four characters, where the coefficients are characters of representation, of projective representation of the centralizer, or representation of some central extension. Okay? And then, uh, okay, a normalization condition, if you want. When G is the identity, we want to reobtain the ordinary twin in general, and when both G and H are identity, we want the elliptic genus of K3. Now, these are uh, the conditions. If you just use this, it's very difficult to find if these functions exist or not, because we have, in a sense, too many degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom come for all these phases, which are unspecified. So there are phases here, phases here, a projective representation that we don't know what it is. So it's very difficult to check like this. So we need some further constraints on these phases. And these constraints come again from the theory of orbifolds of CFTs, especially orbifolds of holomorphic CFTs. So what happens in general in CFT orbifolds is that all these phases are related with one each other, and they have to satisfy various consistency conditions. <coughs> now, thanks to all these consistency conditions, so they can somehow be encoded in the fact that all these phases can be expressed in terms of a single function, alpha, okay? This function alpha is a, a three cochain, so, so it's a, a function from g times g times g into u1. <coughs> it satisfies a certain co-cycle condition under a certain co-boundary operator that I don't want to, to spell it out because it's not very illuminating maybe here. So we want to require that also the twisted twine in general uh, satisfied all these additional constraints that come from a, a generic CFT orbifolds. So just to give you an idea of how this alpha works. Yep? Can you something? So in the early classification, did you also have discrete torsion in the early part of the uh, No, no, no. We didn't take uh, into account discrete torsion. Yep. Uh, in the, okay, bicyclic groups, it's, uh, yeah, it's not there, so yeah. Okay, just to give you an idea, a rough idea. So it's not, uh, the details are not important, so don't focus on the details. But I just want to show that if you give me alpha, this function alpha, I can define this auxiliary function CG, okay, by some complicated thing. And this CG of H1, H2 determines all the phases. So the projected representation is determined by this CG. This is the multiplication rule. All modular transformations are determined in terms of these. Here I, I drop the usual factors of uh, weak Jacobi forms, okay? And also under conjugation, I obtain this thing. Now I told you that there is an ambiguity in phases 
in the, fa in the definition of this 5GH. So one can try to uh, redefine these guys by multiplying them by some phase that can depend on G and H, okay? And try and try to somehow cancel some of these phases using these two definitions, okay? So what happens if you do this kind of thing is that uh, the redefined twisted twine in general obey these conditions with respect to a redefined alpha, okay? But this, this redefinition of alpha just corresponds to what is called a shift by a co-boundary, okay? I didn't explain exactly what co-boundaries and cycles are, but you can think that there is some sort of cohomology going on here, okay? And the, the, what is really important that is independent of all the choices to made is the cohomology class of this, of this guy here. Okay, so if the cohomology class is non-trivial, there is no way to kill all these phases. Okay? Very good. Uh, let's apply this to N24. So first result by the Torsi, Kirich, and Dallas in 2010. The third cohomology group of N24 is Z12. Okay? They also, actually, they also write a, 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 a routine for a gap, for a computer program to to make computations with these cycles, so th this was very nice <laughs> from them. So the first thing is to check which cohomology class is the relevant one for our problem. Okay, how do we determine this? Well, we have already some twisted twine in general, no? We have the twine in general, right? We know already this, these guys. I told you that some of them, for some of them, we have to uh, uh, have some non-trivial multipliers. So we can just check if there is a conjugate, if there is a cohomology class here that reproduces exactly the multipliers that we have for this twine in general. And in fact, there is a unique class of order 12, so a generator of, the, of this group, which gives exactly these guys. So now we have identified the class. We can compute all multipliers of all the twisted twine in general. We can determine which projective representations we are looking at. We can determine the phases under conjugation. So we determine all the phases which are undetermined before. This puts very strong constraints on this twisted twine in general. And in fact, if we only impose the modularity conditions, okay, it turns out that all the twisted twine in general are determined up to normalization. Okay? In many cases, they even have to be zero because there is no way for them to satisfy all the, all the conditions, essentially. So once you, after imposing the modularity condition, you have to check if there is this kind of, of uh, decomposition. So we have essentially no degrees of freedom. We can only normalize in different ways these guys to make, to make them fit. And I, I stress that the projected representation which is relevant is fixed by the cocycle alpha, okay? So we have checked this. So we, could, we didn't prove that this decomposition works in general, but we showed for each G and for the first 500 deltas here. Okay, so we have at most one parameter here, but the first 500, the thing works. Yep? So you never have to construct explicitly a twisted lower space in terms of G and C, right? Mm, the twisted? You, you never have to explicitly construct mm. a twisted vector. No. 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 Yeah. So this is the result. I think this is very strong evidence in the favor of this conjecture. And let me conclude. So what generalized Matthew Montaigne suggests is that M24 should be, OK, it should be some uh, automorphous group or some kind of algebra. and. All the properties that we have checked so far match with the properties that one expects from a CFT. But there is this problem that this, there seems to be no CFT that, that, that is the right one. At least, uh, I mean, CFT in a very uh, strict, uh, and, uh, strict sense with all the nicest properties that a CFT might have. So one might want to uh, relax some of these properties, so look for some weaker structure, okay? that explain all these things. Or maybe one should look for some richer structure, in some sense, so uh, with more fields and uh, in some uh, uh, wider sense. So uh, some attempts are uh, exalted this idea of uh, looking at the chiral Duran complex, for example. Another idea is to look at the somehow vaguely related 
conformal field theory when the elliptic genus appears, which is the, which is the, uh, the one. <laughs> I think this, this gives the idea of how they <laughs> related it is. And uh, the point I think that one needs to understand is what properties of a conformal field theory is, are really needed to explain what we observe and what kind of properties we can just drop and throw away, okay? And uh, I'm not sure how to, how to answer this question, but I think this is somehow a, a good way to think of the problem. So that's it.